For those of you uh, joining, uh, welcome. This is an executive panel discussion, employee engagement and recognition, trends and tips for 2024. And we're gonna get started in about uh, 30 seconds here. Okay, welcome. Uh, very excited for all of our folks that are joining us virtually. Uh, my name is Matthew Willis. I'm a senior VP with a company called Advantage Club. We have 4 million users, 120 countries, and we do employee engagement and recognition. And as part of what we do is we try to provide thought leadership on a bi-monthly basis with some of the executives in the field who are practicing all things related to employee engagement, recognition, culture. And so we have a real all-star field here today to talk with us about some of the trends and tips they are seeing personally with their organizations and also in the marketplace. So to get us started, we'll give you a quick map of what we're gonna cover today the next slide. So first is we're going to give you a quick update, a couple slides on what are the trends and what are the landscape. And then we're going to go into three big topics today with our panelists. Hey, how do we understand employee needs? A lot has changed post-COVID. What are we seeing out in the marketplace? Secondly, how to engage employees, tips and tricks, and recognizing employees. What, what are some tips from the panelists? So before we move forward, I just wanna give a quick intro to who we're meeting with today. <clears throat> Number one, we have Jennifer Jackson, who is with the uh, firm Sullivan Strickler, where she's the chief relationship officer. Jennifer hails out of Atlanta and has a long, illustrious career managing uh, both for-profit and many not-for-profit global organizations and teams. She is a serial entrepreneur. She is a company co-founder, mm -hmm. and she ex has ex a special exper expertise in the legal tech and professional services world. In addition to Jennifer, we have Mark Cunningham. Uh, Mark is an executive today uh, with Result CX, where he manages over 23,000 employees. Um, he is affectionately known uh, on his LinkedIn as the talent guy, which I love, uh, putting people at the heart of customer experience. Um, Mark has a long and, and very credible experience um, and resume with such small companies as Countrywide, Xerox, et cetera. So very excited to have him talk to us and, and really an expert in fully engaged workforces and how to support those workforces. And finally, we have Emily Pelosi. She uh, had her uh, received her doctorate in organizational development. And uh, Emily has spent a, a lot of time over the last several years with very small companies like Amazon, CenturyLink, and Intuit, where she does employee experience and, and really looks at the analytics behind key HR and business performance metrics. Um, also has a wonderful moniker as the employee listening head at Intuit. So very excited to have a, a, just a great panel today. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started with just some stats to kind of, kind of set the landscape of what's going on out there today. So 2024, what's going on? Well, well the punchline is the job market is still tough. Um, we're still having problems bringing in people and it's hard to retain people. So from Gallup, 78% of people are not fully engaged at work. And that means over half of our employees today in North America, they're looking for their next job, either actively or passively. And we have 33%, up to 33% of new hires are still looking for another job or they leave within 90 days. So that's across all industries, that's from Gallup. In addition, from Deloitte, the disengagement costs, so lack of productivity, um, costs up to 34% of an annual salary when you have a disengaged employee. 
So we have a real problem on our hands. Next slide. Secondly, companies believe they are engaging employees. And if we were all together and we'd say, hey, raise your hands if you're, if you're doing something for your employees, are you engaging them? Are you recognizing them? Almost everyone's gonna say yes. All of our CEOs are gonna say, absolutely we do things for our employees but there's a disconnect, right? So 90% of business executives are gonna say, yes, we recognize our employees. But if you turn around and talk to the frontline employees, say, hey, have you received recognition? Up to 68% are gonna say, no, I haven't received any recognition over the last year. And with Gen Z, it's higher. We're, we're feeling excluded at work, right? We're, we're not maybe working together, we're remote. The silver lining is, for those same people that say, hey, I'm not being uh, included, there is a high level of, hey, if you include me, then I'm all in, then I'm excited. So there is an opportunity out there today that exists. If we can engage, we can recognize there's, there's a big uptick. And that's what people want uh, in today's environment. So let's move on to our our uh, first topic today for the panel, understanding employee needs in a remote world. Now, we've all learned pre-COVID, now post-COVID, people are not as happy uh, in the workplace than, than they were five years, 10 years ago, but different employees have different needs. So how do we address those? And if we look at the next slide, we've got the Jess Bursman Company, it did some analytics uh, across industries and they came up with six areas uh, that employees are saying, hey, here is our needs. And they rank those in terms of high to moderate in terms of what I need. This is a busy slide. You will have access to this after, after our presentation. But what are we hearing? We're hearing, hey, number one, I need to feel as an employee trust in my company. I, I need the mission. I need a transparency. I, I need to feel like people are investing in me. In addition, I need a supportive workplace, inclusion, diversity. Then I need career growth, well-being, leadership, and purposeful work. So that's what we're hearing. And that has been exaggerated in this post-COVID world where we're not all working together simultaneously. So let's go ahead and ask the panel and I'm gonna start with uh, Emily first, and then we'll go to Mark and then to Jennifer. What are you seeing either at your own organization at, at Intuit, Emily, or, or, or in the marketplace, trying to understand employee needs? What are you seeing out there? Yeah, that's, that's a great question to kick us off. I had a feeling you were gonna start with me first. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I guess when we're looking at, I guess, what employees need at this time, I really like to try to find the common threads between what we know already versus what's new and different. And so I know there's been a lot of discussion across the industry about what remote employees need versus those that are in an office. Um, but the reality is we have a lot of distributed teams now, right? Uh, we did a lot of hiring during the pandemic with people all across the globe. And so the workforce does look different. The way that we work does look different, but I think it's important to remember that the same, the core needs that people have for what makes them love their job and their company has not changed. Um, when you look at the research on what really drives engagement and what employees need, uh, I, I think a lot of it shows up on this slide that we're looking at actually. So trust, transparency. I think maybe those things are more important now, but we've always needed those. Employees have always needed to feel that their jobs are meaningful. They need opportunities to connect with other people um, and they need to have autonomy. <laughs> they need to be able to do their jobs and feel good at them. And that is the formula for engagement that hasn't changed in over a hundred years. So it's a little bit of a hot take, you know, as much as things have changed, especially with COVID, with technology, with a handful of other global crises we've been facing in the last several <laughs> years, um, those core things remain unchanged. Although the way we action them might look a little different. That's great. Uh, Mark? 
So um, building on top of what Emily has, has stated, I think the umbrella word I would use is that they are seen and they have a sense of belonging. Um, those all result in loyalty to the brand and loyalty to one another. And when you have loyalty to one another, you have those building trusted relationships. It's harder for people to disengage and want to go somewhere else. And one thing that we're seeing in Result CX is, um, and, and as I have the privilege of sitting down with our people around the world, I ask them one question, why are you still here? And the number one answer they say is, well, in our culture, it feels like I, I work with family and friends and I feel my supervisors got my back and they're trying to help. So we foster not so much um, valuing our statements or our value statements, but valuing behavior that makes those value statements sincere and authentic. So respect in everything you do with each other and our customers, of course, dignity in the way that you behave with one another and inclusivity, meaning that there's always room for your opinion and your advice and your thoughts. And if the table gets crowded, let's go get even more chairs and get a longer table because people need to feel like their advice when they're asked matters to other people. And when you do that, those all result in a sense of belonging. So the one thing that our people tell us all the time is wellness, the emotional wellness, the physical wellness, and also the financial literacy and wellness. A lot of our employees, 90% of our employees in the customer care world are, are uh, hourly workers around the world, sometimes young, sometimes uh, you know beginning their careers. And so they wanna feel good about themselves, emotionally, physically, financially. And so these are the kind of programs that they ask us to help them with. That's great. Uh, Jennifer? Yeah, so I, I wanna go back to that opening slide, or you don't have to go back, but I'm just going to reference that number that 78% of employees are not engaged is so alarming to me. And um, yes, thank you. To me, that that really jumps out at me and it, it makes me even want to be more intentional um, in connecting people to the mission. Uh, everything that Emily and Mark said is key. And one of the things I'll just sort of underscore, Mark, you used the word, people want to be seen and heard, right? They want to know their value. They want to know they're seen and heard. So in this new landscape of engaging employees, to me, it just takes a little more intentionality because I can't mm -hmm. walk down the hall like I used to as much and just connect and say, hey, you want to grab lunch or you want to go grab a glass of wine after work. That doesn't happen. So the intentionality of hey, what were your thoughts on that meeting? Hey, how are you feeling? Hey, how did your basketball game that you coached go last weekend? To me is much more important. And because that's the only way we're going to stay connected. Um, and then the other on that chart that I really, we, we focus on a lot in my current role is that ongoing training and growth. Um, we give every employee budgets a year and we don't care how they spend it. You know, obviously it needs to be something that can grow them professionally, um, but we don't care if it's an industry standard tech training. We just want them to feel like they have money that they can spend every year doing something that means something to them specifically. For me, I go to a C-level forum where I can meet other executives, um, women executives. So I just, I wanted to just, that jumped out at me too on that slide about the ongoing development and growth. That is something that we have to be much more intentional about as well in this current environment. Um, because that we, we've got to shift that 78% number. That, I feel like I see it when I go out shopping. I see it when I am engaging in the marketplace, but we have a real chance, everyone on this webinar, to, to move the needle on that number. That's great. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, so we have a little bit of uh, tips on how do we find out employee needs. Let's, let's move from needs to this idea of engagement. So if we go to our next slide, what are we seeing in terms of engaging employees? And <clears throat> speaking over the last several years, we, we have a very large companies are around the world that we work with, in addition to lots of small companies. And we're seeing a big push in terms of engagement, kind of five areas. 
And these five areas are number one, meaningful feedback. Now, what, what does that mean? That means virtually every company we're talking to is doing some form of training with leaders or engaging in different ways to get feedback. Not just the customer satisfaction surveys, but more surveys, deeper surveys, better one-on-one -on -one time, more meaningful feedback from employees. Second is, and Jennifer just alluded to it, career training. So actually taking on specific action items um, from what we learned with employee needs, right? Where can we inject more professionalism, more career training for our employees? Then we see a big emphasis, volunteering is a, is a big catch-all, but designed around, um, hey, not something that is directly in the uh, employment field, but how can we use our time, celebrate our time outside of the work phase, our workplace? So that's another way we can connect folks. Then we see employee groups and big wave of this happened even pre-COVID, employee resource groups, getting like employees together to talk about things like diversity or to talk about things like career training. We're seeing more and more employee groups um, and some of those that are less formal. So employee groups that could be Dallas Cowboys fans, right? And we've got those folks from all over the place. We're, we're seeing cooking clubs, but we're seeing groups that are both professional, but beyond professional ways of engaging our employees together. And then finally are the events and fun. So not only the happy hours, but where can we get together uh, physically or if not, being more intentional about those virtual events together. So those are, I think, the big five that we're seeing. And I now want to turn it over to my panel of experts and say, hey, Mark, you, you've got a very large organization. What are you seeing there personally or from your past um, ways to engage employees today? So we see very, very, very high employee engagement around the world. So our largest population center for the company is in the Philippines. And then we are in uh, also the U.S., Mexico, Honduras, Bulgaria, Ireland, U.K., et cetera, and now South Africa. So we have a diverse group of interests by country culture, by age group, by all kinds of things. But the one thing that we try to do is set a theme every quarter. But we allow that to be a global theme that we all agree upon that's tied into some of our corporate social responsibility it's also tied into what we know to be interesting in the business but we let the purpose and the relevance take place at the local level so for example if it's on environment or it's on education or it's on you know something else uh we we set the standard we say here's our global theme for this month and for this quarter but how are you going to manifest that locally. So purpose and relevance to the employees is most important, I think, in getting them to participate because they come up with the most creative and fantastic ideas. It involves community. It involves charity. It involves working together in teamwork to come together around a common cause that's important to that local city or that local team. And we see that, you know, um, Employee groups, for example, we, we do a lot with military spouse employment. Uh, we have an agreement with the military, the Department of Defense. You know, military spouses have an unemployment of like 25 percent because they're always moving. And so what we try to do is find ways that infuse diversity, inclusivity and inclusion around common things that people are interested in participating with. Now, for career pathing and like that. People don't want to stay if they don't have a clear path to something they're interested in. So keeping that alive and employee communication is key at the direct level between the employee and their, their manager and their manager's manager, but also as a company, telling the employees what our philosophy is, telling them um, what opportunities are out there, posting things internally and sending out reminders. Hey, remember, if you're looking for the new opportunity, talk to your manager about it, but also go online and see what else we have for you. We always believe in promoting from within and giving opportunities at home first. Thanks, Mark. Why don't we go to Jennifer? Yeah, so I'm, 
I'm excited to hear what Emily has to say, too. That was really good, Mark. But one of the things I want to mention is one of the ways we have found to engage employees, especially since 2020, is to get their spouses involved. Um, and so we make sure we have the events regularly, even if it's virtual. We have done dinners and um, wine tastings virtually. And But when we get the spouses involved, it helps us engage the employee by understanding their family more. We took our entire team, including spouses, on a trip um, on our annual kickoff. But what I have noticed is when you get the spouses involved, you get more engagement um, when you're eight, when you're interacting with the employee. But I noticed, for example, my own husband will ask me, did you do that project or how'd that go? Or, you know, he'll push me more, which makes me laugh. But my own husband will push me more now that he's interacted and knows all the other spouses. So I have seen that really bring our engagement as teams and as a company together more by, by again, putting intentionality on the family as well as the employee. That's great. Uh, Emily? I love that, Jennifer. I've not heard of that before involving the spouses and the family, but um, I'm definitely going to take that back to my team. I love that. And and I, I want to kind of thread the needle um, with what both you and, and Mark said about creating opportunities for people to connect locally. Um, that really resonated with me because I'm thinking back to um, a survey that we sent out uh I don't know, during the second or third wave of COVID, kind of lost track. Uh, but um, at one point when we were preparing our hybrid return to the office plans as a company, we asked employees, what are you most looking forward to about coming back to the office? And by and large, the, the most the top response was, you know, reconnecting with employees and colleagues and meeting new people. Uh, so that became a big input into the way we designed our return to office plans. Um, and so at, at, on the one hand, we wanted to create company-wide spaces for employees to connect, having big on-site events and things like that. But we also saw from our data that, you know, people are already in a lot of meetings, they're already pretty busy. and you know, meetings with a lot of people in them tend or gatherings tend to also be rated lower in terms of, you know, being a good use of time and productivity. So kind of balancing those two data points led us to this multi-level strategy where we're planning large company events, we're giving people a platform to get together in person and remotely. Um, but then we're also empowering managers to create spaces for their teams and, and really drive their own engagement in the way that makes sense to them. Um, and so that's been a big part of our, our hybrid plans as well. That was informed by what we heard from, from our employees. And that was another thing I wanted to circle back on. Uh, you know, the first thing you mentioned, Matt, was gathering meaningful feedback as a way to engage employees. And that's super important, but it's also really important that the intervention doesn't stop there. Like taking, sending a survey isn't an intervention in and of itself, right? Like, if you want to earn employees' trust and keep getting them to take your surveys, um, you have to create that culture of employee listening where you just close the loop. And it could be as simple as sending an email like, hey, this is what we heard and we're going to go action that feedback. Um, you don't have to have all the answers right away. You don't have to say this is exactly what we're going to go do because of what you said. And sometimes you could even say, you know, this is what we heard and we're not able to action that at this time. And here's why. Uh, but you can say something and showing that you've heard employees um, goes a really long way toward engaging them, even if you can't give them everything they want today. Right. So that was something I just wanted to underscore today. That's great. And that provides a great transition if we go back to our slides, um, because we do have a audience question that just popped up. Um, so I'm going to show this slide and then I'm going to ask the question to the panel. You can go ahead to the next slide on consistency. So we do have some stats today that says, hey, not only is engagement important, but the, the big benefit is that consistent experience, that consistent experience, because that drives that higher engagement. So the question we have, we have two different questions there, and we're going to combine them. It says, for the panel, what strategies can be implemented to ensure consistent communication or recognition or experiences support from leadership? 
So I want to go back to the panel and, and just talk about that. You you brushed on it, Emily, but any any strategies that all three of you use, and maybe we'll go around the horn again, Mark, Jennifer, then Emily, uh, consistent communication or strategies around these? So, you know, at least in, in my experience, consistency is key to build trust. Um, it's that unpredictability that gets people shaky. You know, you change your mind too much about things. And so having a really solid employee communication plan with specific deliverables pre-identified every quarter in advance or a couple of months in advance, as much as you have the resources to be able to plan and keep driving home those themes of the company culture, keep driving home the themes like, as I mentioned for us, it's respect, dignity, inclusivity, sense of belonging, uh, treating people well and taking care of one another. Those are constantly repeated in everything from our uh, leadership monthly roundtables to our monthly communication. Um, and it always has a note from our CEO. So the role modeling begins at the top around that culture and that consistency of communication. And I think um, when people keep hearing that and they keep experiencing that behavior from their own di uh, direct leaders, that builds that trust of consistency, which then leads to, I think, a more sustained employee engagement um, um, outcome. Right. Jennifer? Yeah, what Mark is saying is so critical. And Mark, we have challenges in our current company to do exactly that, to be consistent and not miss a communication opportunity um, to share from the top. And then for me, I know for, I've, I've got the appropriate amount of direct reports. I, I never want to miss my one-on-ones right. and I never want to miss the opportunity to have very candid conversations in those one-on-ones. Um, and I, I've learned, I've had to teach some of my tech um, leadership that these are the questions, these are the times you ask the kind of questions that you get a real candid answer. And you know, if you show candor and transparency, our CEO is amazing at that. I mean, everyone, is, he, he never trusts him. Just put on a brave face when times are bad. We talk about it when times are good. We celebrate it. But I, I just can't underscore enough of what you're saying, Mark, is that constant, that consistency. I've noticed, for example, if employees get a little wobbly when you start mm -hmm. peeling back the layers of how are you really doing? What's really going on in this scenario? It's generally because they feel uncertain because they don't know what's going on. So for me, I, I can point back to that lack of communication to keep them engaged and keep them feeling secure. You know, these are, we're in such insecure times compared to mm -hmm. 10 years ago that I know I've personally put more emphasis on making sure people feel secure in who they are at this company, what they're doing and that we're okay. And so I, I just feel like that has moved up my list in my EQ stack of things I want to focus on. Mm -hmm. And, and so that, that comes from consistency. Love that. Emily? Yeah, I, I don't think there's too much more I can add to this. I, I guess for consistency for my team, we just stay really closely partnered with our comms team. Um, I have a weekly one-on-one -on -one actually with, with one of my comms partners just to get a sense of like, what's the calendar of company communications like this week, right? Like mm -hmm. how can we infuse yeah. some things that we've learned or reinforce some ways we're gathering feedback through our company-wide Slack channel messages, our homepage, you know, emails that are going out. I just, I really try to piggyback off of other comms that are going out to use those opportunities to talk about, hey, here's what we heard and here's what we're doing just to kind of build that muscle over time. So uh, no secret sauce, really. Uh, I just love my comms partners and they, they do a lot to help us, you know, maintain that consistency. Okay, that, that's great. Let's move on. We've talked about needs, and then we talked about engagement. And then we have this idea of recognizing employees. So the data supports, hey, everyone's recognizing employees till we talk to the employees, right? And so what are we seeing out there? We're, we're seeing kind of five buckets uh, of more frequent and more personal recognition. So what does that look like? Service markers. And, you know, traditionally there was service markers for sales. Hey, let's, let's 
let's celebrate those that are that are bringing in the most dollars. Now we're seeing service markers all sorts of ways and automated, right? So 30 days of service, you know, just 90 days uh, attendance. We're seeing customer service service marks. So many different ways to celebrate and recognize um, uh, events within the employee life cycle starting right out of the gates, right? Birthdays and anniversaries, automated, but also sent around to other people so we can celebrate that. We're, we're seeing contests and the contents aren't just around revenue, but other fun contests. So that could be volunteering or that could be all sorts of ways where we have contests and leaderboards. And then we're seeing the learning and achievement. So the certificates, um, proficiencies, um, different types of skills that we didn't otherwise recognize. Now, now we're, we're recognizing that amongst our peers, amongst the leadership. So more frequent, more personal recognition. Panel, what are you seeing today in terms of recognition or what are you doing for your own organization or seeing in, in the marketplace? So we'll go to Jennifer this time first, then, then Emily and Mark. So I'm having trouble with that mute button. Um, so for us, I know one of the things I've seen that's worked really well for recognition is fostering the social recognition from peers. So I know one of the other two may speak on what they're doing for recognition, but I really want to highlight that the more we get team members and people to recognize each other and based on values demonstration, not just performance demonstration. So I love the way, Mark, you said respect, dignity, responsibility. The more you see, so whatever your company values are, you see recognition on um, what the values demonstration then that social recognition, recognition, I think, has been so valuable in this era we're in because I noticed people standing a little taller, smiling a little bigger. I just can see a little pep in their step when, when I do get to be around them from being recognized by their peers. And the other thing it's done is it's illuminated how teams are interconnected. Like I can see, I can follow the data or follow the pattern of who recognizes who for which values demonstration and then how they are interconnected, which helps me support them more. So I just want to highlight that for recognition that often companies, I know in my past, it was all about achievement, but we're in a different time frame and, and we need to recognize more than just their job achievement as well. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, Emily. Yeah, lo lots of good anecdotes there, Jennifer. I, I think, yeah, rewarding the, the personal achievements too is, is a big one. I mean, benefits I personally enjoy at Intuit um, are, uh, I guess the top two that really delighted me when I first joined was the birthday PTO. I'd never had that before. So everyone gets a day off to take within two weeks of their birthday. and. If you don't take it within two weeks, then you lose that time. And that's a good reinforcement to make sure that like you take it. <laughs> so uh, that's that's a delighter. Um, and then Intuit also does spotlight bonuses. Um, so you're actually giving people cash for rewarding uh, or not a gift card, but you know, with Amazon and Wayfair, and <laughs> those are my top two, but all the places you could use the gift card, you can actually give people uh, something to treat themselves with for, you know, doing their job really well or going out of their way for you. So I really like those two things. Um, but but one thing that I really wanted to touch on that you mentioned, Jennifer, was that peer to peer recognition. Um, when when we, we have a question on our engagement survey about uh, the recognition that you receive, and then we let employees give comments. And what we find when people respond to that question is that they mention three different groups of people in kind of informing the recognition that they get. It's their peers, it's their managers, and it's their senior leaders. And, you know, a lot of people are actually surprised to hear, you know, that their peers really provide that. But um, that's a huge opportunity to kind of create, not just uh, recognize people yourself, but create that culture of recognition. Um, and if you create a team where they're recognizing each other, 
Um, that is golden. That is free. <laughs> it's something that makes everyone feel good. Um, and something chronically lacking in our organizations. I think if you, you look at your company and there are no uh, forcing function or, or kind of no mechanisms to provide recognition, I think you can assume it's not happening enough or, or it's not happening to people's satisfaction. So we really have to be intentional about creating spaces and, and reinforcing that culture of of recognition, especially in high performance cultures. Um, that's where we see uh, recognition tend to be lower and really want to focus on that. Great. Mark? So, wow, some great uh, insights and great tips there uh, from both Jennifer and Emily. I think the peer to peer recognition, likewise, is so critically valuable because everybody wants to look, they want to be seen. They want to be heard. They want to know that they made a difference, right? Even if it's their own job or they made a difference to the team or to the company, depending upon what their what their scope of responsibility is. We've institutionalized something in all of our meetings called shout outs. And it's just kind of a practice that we do. Um, and we do it at our monthly roundtable led by the CEO. Um, and it's the, like the top, probably we have about 350 people that attend from around the world. And it's a chance to, to talk about a theme, but as part of that agenda, it's always, we don't end until we have shout outs. And that's peer to peer recognition within that group. And then we do it in team meetings and we do it in just informally a shout out. But the other thing, the peer to peer, we formalize called the rave awards. And it's where peers nominate peers. And also they can nominate others too, but generally it's a peer to peer formal quarterly event. And it's all um, virtually sponsored around the world and they get uh, an award. There's a little bit of cash with it if they win and it's tied to our value statements. So how are you exhibiting this particular kind of value? And it's all nominated by, by a peer. The other thing we do is um, internally employee communication. If somebody's done something extraordinary, we let people know about that. We had one uh, situation where an agent helped a healthcare insurance company member literally saved their life because they weren't calling 911. They called their insurance card and we answered the phone, got a hold of the uh, people, the authorities where this uh, elderly lady lived and literally saved her life. Well, that's worth an accolade, right? Most definitely in any company that would be worth an accolade. And of course, there's the social media. We have a learning and development program and they earn badges as they complete the modules for the certification. And then we applaud them and put that on social media and give them a shout out and say, you know, um, congratulations on your achievement. So you can get really creative and do all kinds of different things. But again, it goes back to the purposefulness to the employee, the relevance to the employee and staying within the culture and values of your company that really um, matter with recognition. Great, great tips across the board here. Okay, so we've covered engagement needs and recognition. And we wanna go by real quick, good old fashioned thank you notes. They go a long way in today's world. So if we look at on our next slide, why do engagement, all right? And I wanna cover this and then we have a, a question for the panel here. Um, what is the return on investment for employee engagement? Well, a lot of this is common sense, right? We have higher employee productivity for feeling better, lower turnover. We get higher revenue per employee, lower absenteeism. And ultimately that results in higher customer satisfaction, right? We're feeling good about where we're at. We're able to provide better service to our customers. Um, so we've got a question for the panel that, that came in, said, um, how do we track this engagement and recognition to performance or productivity? So that that's a touchy one. I want to see uh, for our panel, um, how are you tracking this? Uh, if so, and uh, any recommendations for the listeners? So let's start off with, uh, why don't we go back to Mark on this? And sure. We're be happy to. So one of the things that we've done is we've taken a look at not only the engagement, but what are the business outcomes we're really after and how does engagement fit into that? How do we use engagement as a potential path toward 
achieving these business outcomes, uh, both financially as well as reputationally in the market, et cetera. And so we focused on employee engagement with the idea that we need to drive employee attrition down. In the business process outsourcing world, uh, BPO, uh, and in call centers, attrition can run high just industry-wide. Uh, we made it a mission to um, form the War on Attrition initiative, and we brought together the key stakeholders that have a part of that, came up with a plan, and then we whittled that down to four people and held them accountable, each a representative of those, um, those units, those organizations. And what we found is when we applied the strategies, involved the people in uh, coming up with a solution, and then we acted on those strategies, our attrition dropped tremendously. So agent attrition was triple digits. It's well below that now in just one and a half years. So by tracking that metric, we can tell that a number of the strategies, including employee engagement and other other parts of the, the solution really work. The other one is attendance. Happier people want to come to work. You know, instead of hey, playing hooky, <laughs> as we used to call it in school, uh, we would, you know, do the right thing and, and go to school and like that. But if you feel tired, you're like, oh, I don't want to go. Well, the same thing is true with adults at work. Sometimes you just can't stand up to it that day. So what we find is if you make employee engagement interesting, active, inclusive, people feel they have a part to play. They don't want to miss out on what's going on. And we watched attendance drop. And the third thing is medical claims have dropped. Um, that if you're a self-insured company and you're paying, you have a budget that you're paying for with claims and premiums and all of that, when uh, you pay attention to people's wellness, emotional wellness, nutritional wellness, um, food insecurities, and have strategies to address real human issues, then those humans respect you a lot more in the market and as their employer. We've literally uh, just last week and met with our broker and reviewed our 2023 stats and our medical claims fortunately fell far short of our budget. Uh, you know, they were much lower than our budget. So we see those three metrics um, as having a real good business impact as well as reputational uh, and employer branding as well. That's great. Thanks, Mark. All right. Why don't we go Jennifer and then Emily? Yeah, so I think in my current world, we only really tie employee engagement back to customer satisfaction, which we get a lot of feedback from our customers um, and, and we're intentional about that. And we have almost no employee turnover, to wow. be honest. Our, our stats are unbelievable because we do tend to act less hierarchical and more like a family. Um, so for us, we we can definitely attribute employee engagement to productivity, low, very low turnover, and then our higher customer satisfaction. And, and and certainly in my last several years, the customer satisfaction, you know, feedback has been critical to us. And then of course, taking that back as recognition really helps. So, um, you know, looking at this graph, I'm like, I've got some work to do, but that's that's kind of a, a current state and how we are able to really keep our finger on the pulse of employee engagement. Great. And Emily? Yeah, we uh, really use our engagement scores as kind of the voice of truth of the employee experience. So it's embedded in nearly everything that we do. Um, if you open, if you're an Intuit employee and you open our company-wide dashboard that tracks all of our big goals and metrics as a company, at the very top, we have our engagement score. Um, and so that really sets the tone for, you know, the visibility of how much we want to integrate that into everything that we do. And so we're constantly doing analyses with that to see, okay, which of these survey items, predicts, attrition, what do we want to focus on for the year as an HR org and beyond. Um, we do track changes in scores on engagement and other topics on the survey um, against some of our key uh, HR initiatives to kind of measure success um, as more of a distal outcome, right? Like there's other things that you want to track along the way. Um, but it's a key thing of everything that, that we do. And I, I think one of the reasons for that is that 
Um, our CEO cares very deeply about the culture of the company and engagement as a reflection of that. That's great. It, it reminds me of the late, great uh, Peter Drucker that said, you know, culture eats strategy for lunch. And, <laughs> and having that front and center is pretty impressive, Emily, on, on the uh, employee dashboard. Okay, we're going to move into our final slide here. Uh, to win the marketplace, you must first win the workplace from the late, great Doug Conant. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna close up our presentations and uh, we have, we're right at the uh, 46 minute mark. And so we're gonna do the two minute drill. So for all of our audience members, before we give it back to our panelists, um, I'm gonna thank you in advance for joining. And secondly, we are gonna send out for all those that are registered, um, profiles of our three gate panelists today. They'll link to their LinkedIn profiles. Um, and for all the questions we didn't get to today, because they're still coming in, um, we do have an opportunity to respond. So we have a couple HR engagement leaders, some of our senior folks, you can set a meeting with them or simply ask a question, or you can get a copy of, of, of this seminar, all of which will come out to you. So you'll receive an email and have an opportunity to, to respond. So with that, we're gonna go around the horn and this time we're gonna start with Emily and then we'll go to Mark and then we'll end up with Jennifer. And just two minutes, final summary, um, uh, covered a lot of ground here. Any other uh, tips, advice, thoughts uh, for all those attending today? So we'll start with Emily. It's no small task to try to summarize a great conversation and just really appreciate Jennifer and Mark's insights on this. So um, I won't take up too much time. I really want to hear what they have to say. But I think, um, you know, one of the things I encourage leaders to do often, um, and I, I mentioned it earlier on this call, is just getting that feedback, finding ways to encourage employees' voices, gather that feedback, and then make sure you follow up. Uh, because I'm sure we've all heard this at some point, but asking for feedback and doing nothing with it is worse than not asking at all. Um, so I, I leave you with that encouragement to um, be fearless and going out and collecting that data, um, but then also being very transparent with employees to, under, to, to share with them what you heard, um, and what you're doing about it, because that that's that's the piece to employee listening that's very important is um, making people feel heard. And that's how you do that by telling them. Great. OK, Mark. So first, Emily and Jennifer, it was a pleasure serving with you. Uh, I learned so much from you both, and I'm going to take away a lot of great ideas from you. And Matt, thanks so much for inviting me and for the Advantage Club for sponsoring this. I guess my final thought is um, the way that you treat employees and the way that you engage employees is all about the sincere behavior and the role modeling as leaders that you conduct yourself, right? In the workplace and around the workplace. And it starts with the CEO. Um, I, I love what I've heard out of, out of both Jennifer and, and Emily about how their CEOs are, are role models for employee engagement and culture, because it starts there and the senior leadership team. The CEO can't abdicate to the senior leadership team and the senior leadership team can't abdicate below. They all have to be working together like cogs in the, in the clock wheel. And so be that role model yourselves, I guess, is what I would say is the tip. Be that role model and the results will come. Jennifer? Yeah. Yeah, I also want to say thank you. It's been uh, such a pleasure to learn from Mark and Emily. I've got two pages of notes here, and I recognize how much work I still have to do, which is a good thing. But I, I think my message or my summary would be that as leaders, the greatest privilege in our lives should be working with the people that we get to steward. I mean, we get to impact and influence lives. And so not to engage people, not to pull the gold out of them, so to speak, not to find which which button to push and, and lever to pull that it, with the way they are wired and what they need to do their best work is, is just a crime. So I just think it's such a privilege 
and, and an honor to talk about how we can um, make the most out of the place we spend the abs the most time in, right? We spend most of our um, week at work. And so why not make it such an engaged, fully alive, fully productive, fully active environment? So um, I, it's just, I've, I've taken some real nuggets and, and this has just been a pleasure. So thank you. Great. And with that, we're, we're wrapped up today. Thank you to the panelists and thank you all for joining us today. And uh, we'll, we'll touch base with you here this afternoon with an email. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.